Welcome to this Sora podcast. I'm Deputy Editor Dan Howarth, and I'm joined today with my co-host, Michael Wilson. Good evening. Evening, Michael. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Yourself? Yeah, can't complain. Very excited about today's podcast, as per usual, but this is a particularly special one for us, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah, well, we've got the author of the latest novella, The Visible Filth. Exactly. So today we're going to be welcoming Nathan Ballingrud, uh, author of the latest This Is Horror novella, The v- the Visible Filth. Um, I've just got a little bit to read from the back of um, his short story collection, North American Lake Monsters. Um, so I'll just do his author bio very quickly and then we'll get Nathan on to, uh, to get chatting about his work. Nathan Ballingrud was born in Massachusetts in 1970, but spent most of his life in the South. He's worked as a bartender in New Orleans and a cook on offshore oil rigs. His stories have appeared in several years' best anthologies, and The Monsters of Heaven won the inaugural Shirley Jackson Award for Best Short Story. He lives in Asheville, North Carolina, with his daughter. So let's get him on, shall we? And now for a horror interview. So... Nathan, if you could tell us a little bit about how you first got started writing and what it was that first attracted you to the genre. Um, well, I got started writing. Um, I think like, like, like so many uh, writers, I wrote a lot when I was a kid and uh, I just kind of assumed that, uh, that that's what I would be doing. You know, when I was little, people would ask me what I would be when I grew up and it was always an astronaut and a writer or a veterinarian and a writer, you know, the usual stuff. And, uh, and I started writing or reading rather horror fiction when I was in my early teens. My mom was a big uh, Stephen King fan. And so I would uh, pick up The Shining when she was done with it and read that. And even though I didn't understand probably at least half of what I was reading, um, the scares were, were real. And I, I, I responded in a visceral sense. And uh, I've had a taste for it ever since. That sounds like, you know, a reasonable enough reason to get started. And I, I think a lot of people do find that it's um, a family member or a close friend who has an interest within the genre. And then it's that passion that is passed on to you. Yeah. And it's uh, and I guess I guess it just uh, it, it kindled something because uh you know, my mom has since stopped reading uh, that kind of book, I think. Um, but of course, with you know, with me, it just I had to read more and more. And uh, there was something just very, very visceral about it, and I think very honest about it. Um, even though it deals with sometimes, or often, it deals with supernatural, fantastical tropes. It it, it seems it seems in a way more. Um, more real uh it seemed that way to me anyway it seemed it seemed like it was addressing the the uh the, some of the, you know the issues of life in a in a more in a more more direct way than uh than other kinds of fiction were um it just seemed it seemed to me that the life itself was scary and it and and still is scary and is and uh i i just i felt that it was a more honest kind of fiction so was there a story or a specific moment within a story where you thought this this is really authentic and it resonated and you realized that that was the type of fiction that you wanted to write and were also interested in reading? No, it wasn't so much of a specific uh, trigger like that. It was more just a, a, a constant a constant influx of this kind of, of this kind of of of, uh, of reading and i think it just it was more of a more of a it was a more gradual and uh steady acclimation to but than it was a particular thing um but i knew that when i when i uh when i read outside the genre which which i which i love to do and which i think is absolutely crucial for any any writer or reader to to read widely but when i do there's a particular kind of uh there's a particular frisson that i don't get and that i that i only get from horror fiction and uh and it will always keep me coming back yeah i think sometimes the mistake that 
writers can make is to read too narrowly, as you say. And I, I think, unfortunately, if you do that, then you're just missing out on all the great writing that's out there anyway. Something that we've recommended in numerous episodes on the podcast is the Best American Short Story oh, Anthology. Yes. Like ev- every year, you just get such a wide variety of fantastic fiction which kind of spans across all sorts of genres and i found that to be a great read in terms of just exposing me to writers that perhaps i wouldn't have necessarily uncovered if it wasn't for that absolutely and one of the great virtues of that particular series is that they have revolving editors and so you're not just getting the same flavor of uh of non-genre fiction every year and um and so it it does give you a a pretty gives you a pretty uh, wide canvas of what's what's going on in american fiction but even that is of course only a pretty particular slice of the pie you know that's that's just american short stories you know there's so much more even beyond that um so it's kind of incumbent upon upon a writer or a reader to uh to seek seek out these different kinds of avenues uh, and, and and kind of take it upon themselves to find different sorts of fiction. It just adds layers to what you're writing, doesn't it? If you if you're kind of aware of different styles of fiction, I think authors Absolutely. that kind of plow more deeply into the genre itself just you know become obsessed with the scares, maybe, or you know become obsessed obsessed with gore at, at the detriment of of a richer, wider story, which all the best horror and you know, otherwise genres have as well, don't they? You know, it's it's not just about trying to scare a reader. There's there's much more exactly. diversity to a story than that. Exactly, and you get diminishing returns if you're only reading what you like to write. Um, it's just you know, you, you you that well starts to run dry, and you you lack the kind of uh, you lack the variation. You lack the kind of genetic diversity that you that you need to pr- continue to produce uh, good and engaging and readable fiction. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, in your interview very recently with A.C. Fuller on the Writer 2.0, mm-hmm. I believe that you said that you quit writing, uh, was it in your 20s? Because you you just didn't feel that what you were writing was original enough, or it just there was something that, you know, wasn't really ringing through and then you decided to come back to it a number of years later is is that right first off (laughs) yeah that's correct um it wasn't so much about a concern over originality as it was i was worried that it wasn't uh that it was it was very slight um i wrote a couple of short stories and and placed them both and uh and uh, you know, I, I was you know, I was at a friend's house, my friend Dale Bailey, and uh, and we were talking about what we were reading. You know, we were talking about the general things that writers do when they get together. And uh, and uh, I had just read a short story by Ernest Hemingway uh, called "A Matter of Degree" or "A Question of Degree." I, I can't remember exactly which, uh, but it was, it was a very small short story, you know, as Hemingways often are. But it it carried this this enormous power. Um, outsized for its, the, for its length, and uh, and I, it was just a. Uh, it was it was it kind of it kind of had me reevaluate what I wanted to do as a writer. You know, the the the, the impact that that story delivered to me was what I wanted to replicate, or at least try to replicate. And the stories that I had written weren't anything close to. Well, we weren't even aimed in that direction. Is what I should say. And uh, you know, I had lived. A, fairly standard uh suburban kid life and uh i hadn't had a lot of experience in the world and uh and i felt that lack and so i just decided uh, and it was a decision it was a conscious decision that i was just not going to do it i was not going to write until i felt i could uh i could approach it from a more until i could approach it more ambitiously and with a uh, with a greater degree of uh of knowledge and wisdom maybe and so i just stopped and um I always knew that I would go back to it, but that's when I moved to New Orleans. I uh, started working on the oil rigs and 
tending bar and working in kitchens, and it was not all it's not all directed to. Uh, I didn't do all those things because I thought that it helped writing. I just started to do those things because <clears throat> because it was just it was just getting out in the world, um, and uh, and it eventually it just felt right again. And so I just started to write, and uh, I wrote "You Go Where It Takes You," and and that was the first story that I wrote that I felt was moving in the direction that I wanted to move as a writer. So was there something or a particular impetus that led to you picking up the pen again or or certain events that happened in your life and you thought, okay, now I feel <coughs> that I can return to writing? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. No, it was nothing so dramatic. It was just uh, I had this, uh, this story idea in my mind and it seemed good, so I decided to write it. Uh, this was back when I was tending bar, and uh, when you tend bar, you tend to kind of cultivate the crowd that uh, that you want, because the people who come in to see you are those who share your interests. And so it was after a few years, the folks who were coming to see me were also, you know, they were readers, and some of them were aspiring writers, and we th- those were just the kind of things we talked about. And so that became that became just something I was concerned about again, something that was in my mind again. And, uh, and once that happened, I just decided to start writing. And when I finished it, of course I thought it was a terrible piece of work, but, uh, but you know, that's standard for most of us. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Certainly relate to that. (laughs) (laughs) So once you do finish the first draft, I mean, what, what does the redrafting and editing process look like for you? Well, because I'm, uh, I'm a pretty uh, slow writer generally. Uh, my f- final drafts are, are the, when I finish writing the first draft, it's usually pretty close to the final draft. And that's not because it all comes out wonderfully. It's because uh, it's because I worry each sentence, each paragraph so much as I go along that um, that in a realistic sense, they've probably been through three or four drafts. It's just that all three or four tend to happen at the same time. So I will finish a story. I will, uh, if I can, if I'm not running up against a deadline, I'll set it aside for three or four days, ideally longer than that if I can, uh, although I rarely can because I'm almost always behind deadline. And, uh, and then I'll just read through it and I'll try to read it out loud to myself if I can because a lot of infelicities that I can't see with my eye, I can hear uh, when I read them. And... Uh, and I'll give it a, I'll give it another pass, and then I'll send it off and cross my fingers. Are you writing every day? No, I try to, but it almost never works out. You know, um, I'm a, you know, I got a full time job. I'm a single dad, and uh, and and so those other responsibilities are more, are more pressing. Um, certainly, being the being a being a dad is far more important, and so. More often than not, uh, I don't get to sit, I don't get to sit down every day. I try to, and I try to keep my uh, my goals fairly fairly modest. If I can get down between three and five hundred words when I sit down, I consider that a success. And if I get beyond that, that's all bonus. But if I at least hit that, then I don't you know I don't end the day feeling as though I've I've uh, failed my obligations. And so you know the work doesn't come out at a galloping pace. But at least it does come out somewhat steadily. You mentioned that you're a you know you're a single dad, and there are a lot of themes of of fatherhood and and families within the stories, particularly in North American Lake Monsters. I was just um you know is that a theme that was kind of consciously you know brought up in your fiction, or is it something that you realise when you look back at what you've written, kind of thing? It was more the latter. It was more something that I, that I kind of became aware of. Not necessarily after it was over, but you know, in the midst of writing all these stories, um, and that's just because, you know, that's what I know most intimately and most viscerally, and uh, and I try to write about those kinds of things, things that I can bring a lot of emotional weight to, and uh, and so it's usually about family, and I think family is the most, I don't know, it's such a ripe, it's such a ripe area for fiction. Uh, it's it's where. It's where we feel all of our most profound emotions, and uh, and so you know it's it's a it's a it's a ground I don't think you can ever really exhaust. 
but yeah, it, it, since I draw from life, I'll I'll use more cosmetic things from life, like like uh, like the oil rigs or like you know working in a bar. But um, but the stuff that the stuff that really has uh, the stuff that really has some weight behind it is usually the stuff involving parents and children or uh, or adult relationships. Sorry, Michael, I, I cut across you to ask that question. If you want to carry on, no, it's a it's a very good question, and I think it leads us nicely into talking about the flawed protagonists and at times quite unlikable characters <laughs> <laughs> that, that dominate most of Nathan's fiction. But, I mean, they're, they're unlikable in terms of morally quite objectionable most of the time. But, yeah. but you often evoke sympathy and always hold the reader's interest so i wonder what type of uh, concerns you have going into the writing and how you ensure that even when writing about the lowest of the low as it were <laughs> that <laughs> that they have the human qualities that uh, are going to resonate with the reader and are, are going to intrigue well, there's a there's actually there's, there are a couple different ways to approach that question. Um, the uh, I like writing about uh, morally objectionable people. Um, I think that we live in a world which is uh, tends to be pretty tribalistic, and uh, and we we tend to you know we tend to identify certain traits in other people that we recognize as being as being evil or objectionable, and we get to we get to paint them into pretty simplistic uh, caricatures of themselves sometimes because of that. Sometimes that's warranted. Usually it's not, though. And so one of the things that I do consciously try to do in a lot of the fiction that I write is to take some of these people and and try to try to examine what the world looks like or feels like from their perspective. How does someone, like, uh, like in the story of the NSS, this kid who's getting sort of uh, romanced by this uh, white supremacist movement, where does he have to be to make that appealing to him? You know, how does that, how is it that somebody who, who is not necessarily born into this villainous mindset, how does he find his way into a place where that makes sense to him? And uh, that's interesting to me as a writer. It's inter interesting to me, or like the, in, the, in the title story, the uh, North American Lake Monsters, where the, the ex-con comes back and he's this kind of, terrorizing force within his own family and uh so the, the challenge is to take those guys and to write them as as to be human beings and so that if we can't agree with what they think maybe we can at least try to understand why they think it or how something might come to be i think one of the great uh duties i hate to see well, duty might be too strong of a word but something that that fiction can do very well something literature should do very well is uh is to is to create empathy or to 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 kind of exercise the the empathy muscle in people and so that we can try to look at each other and try to understand each other as as nuanced individuals rather than you know this kind of cartoon like representations of ideologies and uh and so that's one of the reasons I like to write about characters like that now when I do I often feel I often feel like maybe this time it's it's not going to work. You know, people are going to read the story and they're going to think this guy is just such a monster. And how come this writer keeps writing about monsters? Maybe he's one too. But um, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's something I really can't steer away from. It's just too compelling to me. I just, it's it's one of the drives I think that uh, that pushes me along as a writer. I think one of the scary things about some of your protagonists is that sometimes you know without necessarily agreeing you can kind of see their point i think that's one of you know one of the achievements of of a lot of the stories within the book from from my point of view you, you know you get us inside their heads to the point where you can think you know you can see how their actions would make sense to them as characters and i think that in itself is is a scale that's certainly my hope and um i think some of this came when i was tending bar you know we all kinds of people would come in there and um, i get to know some people 
who I might not, you know, choose to associate with in my in my private life. But they came in and they'd have drinks and they'd, uh, you know, they'd talk and I'd talk to them. And um, and I myself got a more nuanced approach or appreciation of, of you know, some of these guys who might be hardcore right wingers or might be, you know, uh, might be racists, misogynists, whatever. And they would just talk about, they, they wouldn't always talk about this to me, but they'd talk about it to each other and I would hear it. Uh, and sometimes they would talk about it to me. And um it was just it was a it was an education and it was i think uh it was it was vital in the in the process of uh of just being a student of human being human beings and human and human nature and i wanted to write about it so would you say in terms of your growth as as indeed a human being that your job as a bar attendant was perhaps one of your most important jobs that you've had, just in terms of that personal development. Absolutely. Absolutely. That might have been the most important thing. So how long were you tending bar for? Uh, about eight years. Um, I moved I moved out of New Orleans to New York for for several months and I came back to New Orleans and I think it was 2008 or nine that I came back and uh, uh, it was 2008 I think and I I did it up until just before Katrina hit and uh, yeah and that was that was a good eight years of it um, I wish I could have done it longer I love the job I still miss it but um, but it was invaluable and so I think this feeds in quite nicely to a discussion on the visible filth because of course the main well the protagonist will is tending bar in the visible filth so how did your real life experience then influence the visible filth narrative well uh is in, in so far as it uh as it lends the story whatever degree of uh of a uh, verisimilitude believability that it has. Um, the character isn't like me at all. Um, at least not in most respects. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't write about any of the people that I knew who came into the bar, but the bar itself, when I wrote, when I was writing the bar and the, uh, in the story, I just kind of substituted the one that I worked at. And that kind of makes me, <clears throat> that, that helps me to just give it a sense of, of reality, at least for me. So the life, the feeling of the life that's in that story is all pretty genuine. The characters themselves are, are, are strictly made up. The Rogers, for example, that actually happened. Um, I, I, I was just about to ask if you'd had any of these real life experiences and horrific moments with cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You can't go down to New Orleans and not have uh, stories to tell about them when you leave. Uh, in in our bar, yeah, we did have. I think we probably had a nest in the wall, and they would come out a couple times a year, and they would caper over the bottles, and it was just ghastly. Um, you know, the character in the story is, you know, ascribes it to some sort of uh, some sort of mating thing for the roaches. I have no idea if that's true. I know nothing about their about their life cycle, but um, and I'm I'm content with that. But uh, but they would do that every once in a while, and it was just it was just. You know, it would transfix those of us who were there with this this this, this horrible fascination, and uh, and that's one of those things, of course, that I just can't ever shake. And uh, I figured I finally had to put it into, into a story. And it's funny when I put those kinds of things into stories. Sometimes my first readers will say that's too much. You know, that you should scale back on the roaches. And I said, no, but that was really true. And there was a, uh, of course, you know, you always hear as a writer, you know, sometimes the truth is what's unbelievable, and you should do it works for the story but i couldn't take that out it was i had to represent that and there was a scene in a in a story called ss in which there are termites just kind of choking the air and uh and i was also advised that, that was also too much and i was like but that's all that's true as well they look like snowfall it looks if you go out at night and you look at a street light it looks like snowfall there are so many termites around and that happens a couple times a year in new orleans too so so it was fun for me to put that in, as unbelievable as it might be to anybody who hasn't been there. Uh, those things do happen. 
Oh, this is interesting because I'm going to New Orleans in uh, September. So I'll be <laughs> taking some sort of beekeeper's outfit or something to wear by the sound of it. <laughs> yeah, you, you might need it. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> uh Right. Now September's okay. getting towards the end of the end of uh, end of summer, beginning of fall. So you might not have too much of an issue, but but uh, oh. but yeah, the, the, I'm sure you'll see a few. <laughs> oh, good taking taking my extremely squeamish <laughs> other half, who you know I have to take out a, a spider that's the size of a thumbnail. So we'll see how this is going to play out. <laughs> 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 Interesting. That <laughs> no, should be good. Have you had much experience with roaches before, Dan? <laughs> I don't think I've ever actually seen one in, is it the flesh or <laughs> the shell, as you might have to say it. So, yeah. It's well, they're interesting, Dan. Time, I'm sure. The bigger ones are interesting because they, uh, they're they tactic when they're on the ground to avoid being stepped on is to rush you. And so if you, know, you lift up your feet and try to avoid them. But I mean, what it, it appears as though you're being attacked. And uh, there are a few that fly too, and they're, they will occasionally dive on people. So it can be a it can be a harrowing experience. Yeah, yeah I'll, not... I'll take I'll take an umbrella. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're not really prevalent in the UK, so it wasn't until I came out here to Japan that I actually saw one. In the shell, <laughs> as Dan describes it. <laughs> um, but the first time. I saw one, I was teaching, I was doing a team teach with another teacher, and we noticed this huge roach scaling the walls, so we had to try and <laughs> remove it very quickly before any of the young children <laughs> noticed and just started running around and screaming and going crazy as children are prone to do <laughs> in any sort of situation like that. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's funny what you're saying about people telling you, oh, this is too much or it's unbelievable. And I remember when we were talking to Graham Joyce at a This Is Horror event, he was saying that often the parts in his fiction that people say are unbelievable are those bits that were actually true. <laughs> And it's the bits yeah. that he made up that, you know, people are like, okay, well, that yeah, that's plausible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's definitely the case here. I guess it's because when you have an extraordinary experience, you want you you think, well, that's something I've got to put into one of my stories at a later date. <laughs> True, and it's also it's also because it's so particular to New Orleans, and I think it's things like that are essential to understanding what kind of town that is. You know, it's a it's such a um, so much fecundity in New Orleans, and it's also so much decay, and they they, ex they exist at the same time. And and because of its because of its geographical location, of course, it's a uh, you know it's got this kind of subtropical environment. It's very hot, and the insects thrive there. And so you want to. You, you want to contain as much as you can the uh, you know the sense of uh, you know the positive senses of New Orleans, the things that are, that it's famous for, but also these strange these strange sort of biological realities of the city that don't often get that I don't actually see often you know uh, addressed in other other stories or, or films or whatever. And so, but to me, they're as much a part of the, of the city as anything else. And so, it would feel dishonest to the town if I wasn't including those kinds of things because those are those are fundamental to what what makes it what it is. And I think some of the most powerful fiction can be the stories in which place is essentially another character. Uh, one of my favorite novellas a couple of years back was by. Stephen McGay, he wrote a book called Habit. Dan, have you read that one? I have, mate, yeah. Yeah, because that, that is actually particular to Manchester, which, of course, is where Dan's from, so I guess it resonated even more for you. Yeah, pretty much brought me back to all those rainy afternoons at my 
Nan's house in Withenshaw, just thinking, wow, it's rough around here. (laughs) (laughs) Is it a book that you're familiar with, Nathan? No, it's not. I'm writing it down right now, actually. Yeah, it was was commissioned by Nicholas Royal. I have a feeling it it must have been released by Salt Publishing. Yeah, I think it was. yeah. Yeah. I don't think that Stephen has released anything else yet, but it it really was a very strong debut novella, or, or or novel even. I can't remember. It was either a long novella or a short novel, but it <laughs> I was think, bloody good. I think good. it'd be a short novel, yeah. Yeah. Well, good. I'll look, I'll look for it. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think setting is, especially when you're talking about horror fiction, setting has a, such a strong role to play. <clears throat> and when we think of... Uh, when I think of iconic horror stories, uh, it's very hard to disassociate the story itself from where it took place. Um, you know, you think of uh, you know, Lovecraft's New England, you think of, uh, or even his, the story is set in Antarctica. You think of uh, Stephen King's his own his own uh, his own kind of main landscape. Uh, I'm reading a writer named Michael McDowell now, uh, a novel called The Elementals, which takes place on the Gulf Coast in Alabama. And these little, three old Victorian mansions running down, and it's such a strange image, you know, the the idea of these mansions sitting on a seaside and being covered by sand dunes. But it is, uh, you know, it cements the story uh, in a way that that would it wouldn't be cemented if it were set in a in a place where the setting didn't matter to it. And uh, I think, yeah, I think I think setting is almost always a crucial element of a successful horror story. Yeah, I could not agree more. So what was the original inspiration <clears throat> behind the visible filth? It was cell phones and uh, and how much uh, we, and when I say we, I mean specifically me, I, am addicted to them and hate them at the same time. You know, I, I carry this thing around all the time. And I find myself reflexively checking it to see if someone is you know, trying to contact me. And, uh, and I think about, you know, the sort of paranoia that comes along with having one, you know, in the, uh, I know some friends who, uh, you know, who were in relationships and the cell phones became vessels of, uh, of anxiety. You know, the, they would worry about who is he texting? Who is she texting? What, what images are being sent? You know, uh, I sent this text. How come I haven't been? How come I haven't gotten a response in as timely a fashion as I need? And uh, and they're just they become awful things. And so I thought about them as being these um, these vessels for this 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 kind of dark energy that kind of ruins your life. And uh, and I, that was just the kernel for it. And then you know I was searching around for a for a, a kind of a frame to hang this idea on and. Uh, and you know, I was on a deadline uh, to you guys, and uh, so well, I need to move, start moving quickly. So, uh, so I'll write what I know best. I'll write about you know as much as I've written about bar life in New Orleans. I've never actually written about a bartender in New Orleans, so I'll do that. And uh, it just kind of came together from different ang- different angles in that way. And so, given your own love hate relationship with cell phones, have mm-hmm. you kind of put any rules in place for yourself such as right i'm not gonna look at my phone for the first hour of the day or have specific uh times when you decide to leave it at home no indeed you know i'm a, I'm a hypocrite <laughs> i uh i you know I, I i i hear people doing those things and i think oh that sounds great i should do that too but i don't uh, uh maybe one day i'll summon the the will to do it um, I do know, though, that when I leave the house and I, I forget it, leave it behind, I'm grateful, you know, in some underlying sense. The, the, you know, the cosmetic sense is, is a sense of anxiety, like, oh, God, what if something amazing is happening and, I, and I'm going to miss the opportunity, which is utterly irrational. Uh, and more deeply, though, I feel as though I've accidentally left my, uh, you know, my manacles at home. So, you know, if, if the – when the grid collapses and the cell phones are are just – cheap plastic trinkets, then I don't think I'll mourn them too much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I remember when we spoke to 
J. David Osborne, he said that he didn't look at his email or his cell phone for the first hour of the day. And yeah. so I, I've actually been trying that out since speaking with him. So I'll start my day with coffee, of course, and then do a bit of uh, non-fiction reading, do some writing, and then only once I've done, you know, like half an hour of writing will I then decide to check emails. And I think that's been working out pretty well because sometimes you will get an email that you just absolutely have to attend to and then you know, that that can stilt your creativity or just, I guess if it's a bad email, it's going to put you in a mood where you, <laughs> it's going to affect you to a point where maybe you don't want to be be writing anymore. <laughs> yeah, but of course, most of it's just junk. You know, most of it's just maintaining uh, utterly pointless, you know, influx of, of, of banal information, which which does nothing more than keep your mind from sinking in a sinking into you know a, a deeper stratum of thought. All you're doing is being is being kept bobbing on the surface of your own intellect, and uh, it's just it's it's not only is it pointless, it's destructive. And uh, and I I remember I listened to that podcast with uh, with with Dave, and uh, I thought it was a great idea. And he'll post that online every once in a while too. You know about his uh, the way he's keeping keeping the uh, the social media at bay and uh, strikes me as being very healthy and um, and something that that I know I must start to do yeah and, and considering think, uh, this, this great productivity too I mean I, I, as busy as that guy is uh, if he didn't do that then uh, he wouldn't be able to do the work that he's doing yeah that's true I think um, I'm still waiting for you know we are in the the age of social media I think be it through film or fiction i'm still waiting for the you know the defining social media horror story be it you know a real one something that happens to somebody in real life or mm-hmm. you know something that somebody somebody makes up from scratch but yeah i think i think it is ripe territory if it's if it's done right you know there's there's a lot of kind of connotations to it a lot of different layers and you know, that's something I'm looking forward to seeing developing through fiction as social media becomes more prevalent. Because I think it is quite a frightening thing when you when you look at it in the way that we've just been talking about it. I think it is too. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to that same thing. The danger in in in, uh, in writing something or or making a film about something involving social media is that it evolves so rapidly that uh, you run the risk of the particular thing you're writing about being redundant by the time people read it, or even just three or four years down the road. Um, I know that I had that concern when I was doing the visible filth, but, but finally you just have to say, you know, the hell with it, and write the story as it is, and and uh, it will continue to make sense or it won't, but you have no control over that. Yeah, of course. And I think with the visible filth, because there aren't any social media sites that are kind of too intrinsic to the story, that it will be a story that will stand the test of time i think it can get it can get difficult when you know somebody's too invested in in one platform so i know i know that there have been a series of stories that involve hashtags which of course are linked to twitter but then i just wonder when Twitter inevitably fades and give gives rise to whatever the next kind of alternative is, mm-hmm. h- how much resonance will these stories have? Will 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 they then appear too obscure to e- to even have much much to them? And I just wonder if the danger is they'll become a product of their time. I think I think everything does though, doesn't it? I mean, you can't. You can't future proof everything, can you? You know, you can't future proof every single story that you write. You know, it can't be, well, he got in his car slash hoverboard slash flying <laughs> car, you know, to you know, you you can't just kind of give a drop down menu of all the different things that somebody interacts with over the course of a story. You know, you can only write what is available or you can only write within the world in which you're writing, surely. I mean, you know, exactly. if, if the writing 
if the quality of the story is there, then surely, you know, people will continue to read it and get benefit from it, even if, you know, the hashtag is outdated, for example. That's right. And I think I think it's I think it's foolish, you know, to even to worry too much about that anyway. Uh, you know, it's you're writing for you're writing for people now. You know, that's that's how I that's how I try to think of this. You know, I'm I'm writing for readers right now. I'm in my lifetime. And uh you know how a story ages, even though you know, I had that thought when I was writing the cell phones, you know, and then the sliding of the thumbs across the screen and and you know the basic iPhone construct, and I thought, was well, this going to make sense another ten years? But finally, you have to just accept the fact that you're not writing for ten years from now. You're writing for right now, and uh, and you know the, we'll just see what happens. You know, but it's 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 you'll drive yourself crazy thinking too much about what will what will still make sense in the future. And there's another story idea right there. Someone who literally drives <laughs> themselves crazy thinking about. <laughs> future-proofing <laughs> stories. <laughs> uh, stories about writers. Yeah. <laughs> that's, one thing that, uh, that's one thing I hope I never do. <laughs> that's, a, that's always been a kind of a pet peeve of mine, writers writing about writers. It's like, it, it, it makes me... This is unfair, I realize, as I say it. Uh, but when I read these things, it makes me wonder you know, how, how disconnected with actual life they've become that the only thing now that's firing up their imagination is, is their own, their own job. But that's my own prejudice. Well, Stephen King's done numerous stories about writers, but... Yes, he has. <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite Stephen King novels? <clears throat> um, the early ones, probably. When I first started, you know, discovering both his, his own work and, uh, and horror fiction in general. Uh, the Shining and Salem's Lot were the two big ones for me. I think The Shining was the one that really, really scared me, really hooked me. Uh, Salem's Lot, still probably the best contemporary vampire novel. And uh, after that, you know, I, I, I enjoyed some of them for a while, but I kind of just drifted away from from uh, from his writing. Although I came back and, and read Misery uh, when that came out, and and that I, I enjoyed that immensely at the time. But I haven't read a uh, a new Stephen King novel in, in in many years, actually. No, so was was Misery actually the last one you read? <laughs> it, it it might have been the last one I finished. I think I tried to read a couple more after that. Uh, I just didn't get into Gerald's Game. I didn't get into Dolores Claiborne, and I think after that is probably when I stopped finished, or when I stopped stopped reading his new work, and that was just. It was just you know we had our roads had had gone different directions. And it was it was nothing. It was nothing uh, really negative about my 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 decision not to read anymore. It was just you know his interests and mine no longer really coincided much anymore, and that was fine. That happens. That happens a lot with almost all writers. I guess given that you listed The Shining and Misery amongst your favorites, that yeah. even though. <laughs> Writers writing about writing is a pet peeve. <laughs> there Good are point. exceptions to that rule. <laughs> Absolutely, there are, there are exceptions to every rule. <laughs> uh, and in and in and because that was a personal prejudice, and it is I recognize it for for what it is too. It's a, it's a kind of a self limitation. Um, and there are, and and yeah, you, that, those are two great examples. And you know, when he writes about the Shining, he's writing about a, a writer. But he's also writing about family dissolution. He's writing about alcoholism. He's writing about so many more things. He's also writing about this really scary haunted mansion, or haunted hotel. Um, and so he's doing everything else so well. And the same is true with Misery. Misery is just this little muscular book. And, uh, and uh, the sense of fear and dread, uh, paranoia that, the, uh, that Annie Wilkes' character uh, indulges in is just so well realized. I mean, when King is on point, he's, he's fantastic and, uh, and does it like nobody else does. So, so yeah, you're right for calling me out for that. It's uh it's there, there are clear counter examples to what I was saying. <laughs> Ever the pedant, Michael. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good point, though. <laughs> Just returning back to the visible filth, have you had any real life weirdness or odd things happen with regards to technology? I, I actually found coming here to Japan, so I signed up for a smartphone and mm -hmm. a couple of months in, I started getting quite a lot of spam. And I mean, obviously it's all in Japanese and I haven't mastered the language that well, so I, it could have been anything really. <laughs> but then the frequency, uh, you know, uh, increased so that it went from maybe getting one every few days to daily, um, multiple times a day, up to the point where I was getting 20 a day and I'm ignoring them. And then <laughs> it was quite sinister. So I'm, I'm ignoring them. And then they start just like sending me like pornography spam. <laughs> and then it escalates to videos. <laughs> In the end, right. I just managed to put a block on all of it. But I, I was thinking, wow, this is like kind of imitating almost the, the visible filth. It's like what would have happened if I hadn't put a block on it? Yeah, it, it was as if they, they were increasing the extremity every time. And what was the, the natural conclusion of that going to be? <laughs> right. And that's just it. It's not, it's not as if something particularly uh strange or unsettling has ever happened to me using using these uh these media it's more like uh it's more like what you're talking about you know i'm i'm intrigued by the the by these these spam emails coming in from these these presumably made up names in which you know there's this uh there's this kind of fictional supposition that there's already been contact between you you know like do you remember me i'm so and so or it's great to see you again and uh, these are people you've never heard of or seen before in your entire life. But it's strange that uh, that there's this kind of immediate uh, fictionalized intimacy, and then or, or these links coming in. We all know not to click the links in the uh, in spam email, and that's because of, of course, you're going to contract a computer virus probably. But it makes you wonder, you know, what if uh, something else? You know, where is it going to take you? What what dark little tunnel is this going to bring me down? And uh, and so that's the strangeness of, of you know, these incursions from the internet uh, is that is that it's it's something that purports to know you and is trying to play upon that that shared knowledge or which a knowledge that will convince it's trying to convince you that it's shared and so that you'll respond to it and if you respond to it you'll trigger something awful and uh, and that's that's where the idea kind of comes from it's like this something is trying to reach you and contact you and it's in one sense it's aggravating it's just you know it's this this you know these computer algorithms and in another sense it's can be looked at as something darker and more sinister and that's 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 more fun to write about yeah absolutely i mean if you wrote a story that was about someone contracting a computer virus and he had to go to the computer shop and get it reformatted i just don't think it would have the poignancy really would it <laughs> yeah, it's pretty compelling stuff yeah. <laughs> and he gets a large bill yeah horror story right there <laughs> <laughs> um the question i was going to ask you nathan was when you finished uh the visible filth you you say that you've got kind of beta readers and and whatnot i was just um I was just trying to gauge what kind of reaction you've had personally to uh, to the way that the book ends. Um, I know that when me and Michael received it through from you, we both read it um, very quickly and had quite a almost frantic uh, discussion by text, didn't we, Michael? <laughs> discussing it mostly went, "Holy shit! Oh my god! This is awesome! Uh, that ending, incredible!" I don't, they weren't very, you know, eloquent sentences, <laughs> but there was definitely a very frantic discussion going back and forth. I was just wondering, you know, what's it like as a writer to receive kind of, you know, what reactions have you had and what is it like to, to receive those kind of reactions? 
Well, for this one, I haven't had reactions about the ending yet. Um, my uh, my beta readers didn't talk about that so much as they talked about uh, minor infelicities in the actual in the body of the story itself that needed to be adjusted or needed to be addressed. You know, things in, that needed to be uh, clarified. So they didn't talk about the ending, which you know I took to mean that the ending was working fine for them. But um, I felt some anxiety about the ending. When I wrote it, it just kind of came organically enough, and I sent it out. But when I looked back at it later, I was like, oh, Jesus, you know, this may have been just kind of uh, over the top even for me. You know, I thought maybe I had gone gone a little bit too far with it. So uh, I'm glad that it was received well on your end. Um, as, as far as how anybody else will receive it, I guess I'll find out, you know, in the coming weeks. But... Um, so with this story, I haven't had a lot of feedback about that. Uh, with other stories, though, I have. Um, uh, with the story, You Go Where It Takes You, which is about a, um, a a mother who ends up abandoning her child on the side of the road, um, I got a lot of mixed responses for that. Uh, some some people responded by, in a complimentary fashion, saying, you know, you address this kind of, this this uh, this thought, this fear, uh, this this awful impulse, you know, you know, in a way that they responded to, which, which is gratifying to hear. But I've also had people respond to me by saying, well, you know, you must really not like being a dad. You know, how could you write something that terrible? And, uh, which is, which is all painful to hear and which, uh, which misunderstands, uh, profoundly the position I came to, uh, came to that story from. I remember the, the the night before I wrote that last scene, uh, my daughter at the time was, I think she was three, maybe she was two, uh, but I felt so awful about what I was going to write that I went in the room and picked her up and hugged her and told her that I loved her, and uh, I kind of had to apologize for the for what I was going to, uh, going to write about an entirely fictional character, because, it, you know, it's it was, because I was afraid of that kind of reaction. You know, I was afraid of the reaction that did come from some folks, and I knew that it would. But uh, that was probably the most upsetting reaction I've had to a story that I've, you know, to an ending to, to a story that I've written. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, when I first read North American Lake Monsters, I was, um, I got it just the weekend before I was uh, flying to Berlin uh, with with my girlfriend, and I kind of, I'm not a very good flyer anyway, so I kind of cracked the spine just as we're going down the runway. Um, I finished the story when we're up in the air and I must admit I was sat in the window seat and my girlfriend always falls asleep on the plane so I was just kind of sat there on my own I, I finished the end to, to that story I just looked out the window and I was just saying to myself Jesus Christ like that I've not been impacted by the ending of a story that much for a very long time as I was but then again the visible filth delivered that same kind of Obviously, it's not the same type of ending, but the same level of emotional impact on me. And it's just, yeah, I mean, that's you go where it takes you was a real eye opener to me. And that was when I got back and I said to Michael, you know, we were looking to commission people for for novellas. And I was like, you you know, you've got to read this book like right now. You've really, <laughs> you know, you have to get a copy of this book. And <coughs> again, we had, the, we had the conversation based on that, didn't we, Michael? And the discussions kind of went from there. But but you you go where it takes you was yeah it was an earth shattering ending for me that one and I would advise any listeners that haven't read it to to go and check it out as as soon as possible really it's yeah it's a sledgehammer of an ending it's fair to say <laughs> well and sometimes I'm accused of not putting endings on stories at all which always you know I get kind of a chuckle out of but I know where they're coming from but uh, like stories like uh, there's a werewolf story in there called Wild Acre. Uh, or the title story, North American Lake Monsters. Some sometimes I'll get messages from people, you know, saying this, the story just stopped, didn't end, and uh, and it did. But the ending that I gave it is was the to the emotional arc of the character, not necessarily to the to the uh, you know the plot arc of the monster. Um, and that's some people would know that, some people are not, and that's that's understandable. And so sometimes I'll get you know more visceral reactions, and sometimes I'll get sort of mystified reactions. With the uh, with the visible filth, I was kind of going towards the former. I don't I don't know what your your impressions of that story were, Michael. But I well, I I was just going to say with regards to 
endings that you, you know some sometimes as Nathan says it does just have to end m more with, with like the emotional arc of the character and the problem is if you were to go for something that I guess is more conventional and in line with story it would feel either insincere or tacked on or or artificial and obviously <coughs> when your biggest concern is the quality of the story you can't afford to do any of those things i mean no no one wants to just tack on an artificial ending to to make it more of a crowd pleaser as it were and you you know sometimes there isn't a natural ending that's just life. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's, and so often, though, it's, it, in genre fiction, and, and particularly in horror fiction, you know, the, the endings kind of fall down because they're trying to give that, they're trying to provide that the sort of, the, sort of uh, the cosmetic monster story ending. And you might have these wonderful setups, but then by the time you get to the third act and they want to wrap everything up, it becomes, it becomes predictable many ways you know we all know how the werewolf story ends or the the two what two or three standard ways it might end uh you know the monster story the ghost story they're all you know these creatures are all expunged in some way um more often than not it, it becomes it becomes disappointing i think when you can see the end coming and it, it fulfills its standard obligations and uh I, as a reader, am often disappointed by those kinds of endings. And so I, I, I really try to steer clear of them. I'm not sure that I'm always successful by any means, but, but it's something that's definitely in my mind when I, when I come to the end of a story. And so you know, a story like uh, Wild Acre, which is about a werewolf, you know, uh, it's, the ending is, uh, it dismays a certain contingent of readers because I don't go back to the werewolf itself and I resolve that particular story arc. Because to me, that's not the important arc. What's important is this guy who's trying to trying to come to terms with his own cowardice uh, in the wake of that particular of the werewolf attack earlier on in the story. And so, once his story is resolved or at least addressed in a, in a final way, then uh, there's nothing more for the story to say. You know, the werewolf stuff doesn't matter anymore. And like I say, some people dig that, and some people are are put off by it, but. But I like stories like that. I like to write them too. And like you say, we all know what the cliched werewolf ending would be anyway, so <laughs> there's no real benefit in writing it. I think with with that story in particular, it would just have cheapened it. And I, I also think it would kind of be implausible. I'm not sure how you'd really do that. <laughs> Well, it's it's no benefit to writing it. It's also a slog to read. As a reader, when I come to the when I when I find myself caught up in the, you know, in the end game of a particular story or novel in which it's been telegraphed, in which I know what's going to happen. And this happens in the movies all the time. <clears throat> it becomes tedious and something that I've, uh, it becomes like a job to finish reading it. <clears throat> and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want to steer away from that as much as I possibly can. Do you find writing ending, uh, writing endings generally to be a challenge for you or more, more a strength i mean how, how what's your general approach i guess this would feed into the planning and how much has gone into uh, preparing the story before you even commit any words to the page yeah usually i have to know what the ending is um even sometimes before i know what the beginning is i will know what i'm what i'm aiming for i'll know what the end point is and and then I'll figure out, of course, how to start it. And it's in the middle where the mystery resides for me as a writer. And that's where the uh, I can get lost or or struggle or or just you know kind of flounder for a while. But if I know where I'm going and the effect that I want to achieve, um, then I can you know then I can build the story up until then up until then, hopefully in ways that I don't telegraph it too much. Hopefully in ways sometimes I might even misdirect a little bit. But um, but if I don't know where the story is going, then I can't move. You know, I have to figure the ending out before I can really get to work on a story. 
that was part one of our two-part interview with Nathan Ballingrad. In part two, Nathan speaks more on the visible filth, on his upcoming projects, and we get to hear more valuable insights into Nathan's writing process. So until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes. You'll be able to find the This Is Horror shop at thisishorror.co.uk and also at thisishorror.co.uk. In the right-hand navigation, you can sign up for our This Is Horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.